Good morning, welcome. So here we are at Flores del Sagrado in San Cristobal de las Casas. It's the 30th of March, yeah? I think. And today we're going to speak about the Yoga Sutra and the practical Patanjali. So yoga is the practical school of Indian philosophy. And the Yoga Sutra is one of the most beloved treasured texts of the yoga tradition. And it's one of the texts that when people start to study yoga, if they get interested in yoga, it's one of the texts that people tend to come to first of all. Because if you go to the bookshop, if you're able to go to a bookshop, and it has an Eastern philosophy section, and you look in the yoga part, you might find lots of books whose titles don't have the word yoga in them. So you Bhagavad Gita, or Upanishads, or all these different names, and you're looking for yoga, then you see, oh, Yoga Sutra, this must be about yoga. And so sometimes people pick up a translation of the Yoga Sutra and they look into it and they think, I'm not sure quite what this has to do with what I've been experiencing in my yoga class where I might have been doing some yoga asana or some pranayama or I've been learning to meditate. And it can seem a little bit uh, off-putting, a little bit kind of not, got, not having so much to do with what I've been experiencing. But once we start to dive into the text and we go into the Sanskrit, we see that actually this text is super practical. And it's a sutra text. So one thing to be aware of is that when I pick up an English translation or a translation of another modern language of the Yoga Sutra, the sutra form doesn't actually exist in English or in Spanish or French or Russian, for example. Sutra is a Sanskrit word that has come through the Latin into many modern languages. So here I am wearing a shirt and at the bottom of the hem there are these little stitches. We could call them sutures. So one tiny little stitch holds, relatively speaking, a vast body of fabric. A sutra is the key to a vast body of associated teaching. So one of the problems is that sometimes people translate the sutra and the equivalent words that we might use in English they don't point in all the same directions as the Sanskrit original. And so we can miss a lot of where the original teaching or the original sutra is pointing when we go to a translation. So if we can, it's really helpful to approach the original Sanskrit and then open the text up from there. And the sutra form, sutra, we've said it means stitch, but in Sanskrit it doesn't just mean stitch, it also means thread. So sometimes we hear the Yoga Sutras spoken of as like the aphorisms of yoga. But a sutra isn't the exact equivalent of an aphorism or an aphorism. Because an aphorism is like a standalone pithy piece of wisdom, a bit like a proverb. But a sutra, it is that, but it's also part of this whole tapestry of one text. So each sutra is woven with the same thread. And this is very significant because if we just look at one sutra in isolation, we could get one idea about it. But we have to remember, this is part of this sutra text. So the governing ideas, they get introduced right at the beginning of the text, at the beginning of each chapter, for example. And so that gives us a big clue, a big key almost, to interpreting the sutras in the spirit that they were intended to be interpreted, which is for the sake of yoga. And what does yoga mean? It means to unify, to bring together, to harmonize, to bring into togetherness. So one of the things that's special about the Yoga Sutra text, as well as it being in the sutra form. So the sutra form, another thing to say here, is that it's this ultra-distilled form. So the Yoga Sutra dates back to more or less a few hundred years before Christ. Back then, if you put something in a library in the Indian subcontinent, what we now refer to as the Indian subcontinent, you have a bit of a challenge and that is the humidity and all of the life forms that that humid fertile land supports. <laughs> so if you put your sutra text or any other text on your palm leaf manuscript in your library, it's very likely that perhaps even in your own lifetime that book will have been devoured by insects or will have rotted away in the humidity. So in the Indian tradition, it's an oral tradition primarily. And Things are committed to memory, not in a rote way, but in a very thorough way, and in a way that accompanies the in-depth study of what is being 
let's say, condensed and encoded in the text. So the Yoga Sutra traditionally was studied practically. So the distilled teaching in the Sutra, it gets elaborated and expanded and applied and explored in the context of the lives of the people who were studying it. So to study the text traditionally means to explore it in practical application in all aspects of life. Not just one in relation to yoga techniques, such as meditation, but in relation to cultivating the medi state, the state of being balanced and integrated in all domains of our life. So, back in the day, if I put something in the library, I might lose it to the insects or the humidity before I want to consult it again. So better, I install it into the uh, operating system of my being. And I'm going to install it with the auto-update feature. How do I do that? By As I'm installing it, I'm really exploring it practically. So I'm getting a real in-depth understanding of how these principles work in the context of a human life. In the Indian tradition, one of the ways that all of this practical knowledge was condensed was through poetry. So the vast majority of the Sanskrit tradition is written in verse. And what I've experienced is that, you know, in poetry, we can condense a lot of information into a relatively short form. The poem can be very suggestive, can have many layers of meaning. So the Bhagavad Gita, for example, which we'll speak about next week, 700 verses, we can recite it in maybe three and a half hours at a fairly uh, moderate, rapid pace. It's not such a big thing to commit to memory. Imagine that if we'd never learnt to read, and we were always emphasizing the auditory intelligence when we're learning, it's not an amazing thing to learn three and a half hours of text. I know people now, in the 21st century, literally know hundreds of thousands of Sanskrit verses by heart. Not in a rote way, but they can call them to mind whenever they need them, to illustrate the things that they're sharing about, for example. But as well as verse, in the Indian tradition, we also have the sutra form. And what the sutra does is it condenses even further. So the Yoga Sutra, the whole text, we could recite it in maybe 25 minutes. It's quite short. But every sutra, it's a bit like a mnemonic, like a memory aid. It's a bit like a formula. So for example, when I was a boy, um, I did some maths at school. And then since I left school, I've been working in the realm of languages and um, literature and things like this. I've not had to use trigonometry or geometry actively in my own life. Of course, I'm speaking here in a house, so I'm benefiting from geometry and trigonometry, but I don't use it actively. But I remember a couple of formulae, because my teacher said, Tweedledum and Tweedledee around the circle pi times d. Yet if the area is to be declared, then they know it's pi r squared. So I remember pi d and pi r squared because of the rhyme. I have a friend who works in aeronautics, like working with aeroplane engineering and design. He uses trigonometry in his daily work. So he knows you can use those formulae hundreds of different ways. I just know the formula. So I can still remember pi d, okay, if I want to know the, um, around how big is the circumference, pi times d. I remember the, the formula. But my friend, who's been applying these formulae in hundreds of different ways, he has a much deeper understanding of them. Sutras are a bit like this. It's a formula that condenses so much practically applicable wisdom. So we learn the formula, and then we start to actually come to understand it when we apply it. So one way I think of the Yoga Sutras is that every sutra is like a lighthouse. So here I imagine I'm on the ocean and here's the, the bottle is representing the lighthouse. So we're all in a different place in relation to the light. But our path, our way, can be illumined by the same light. It's in between us all. If we move position, it can give us a slightly different type of practical guidance. Does that make sense? So, same thing with the Yoga Sutra. We can look into this text today. We can look into it tomorrow and next year. And every time we look into it, it can show us something new. And we can start to expand and deepen our appreciation and understanding of how much practical wisdom these sutras are encoding and indicating and pointing to. So, 
One of the reasons the text is so treasured is because it's very condensed, but it's very, very rich. And it's super practical. One of the other reasons that the text is so treasured is, is it's the text that made yoga a Shastra. So in the Indian tradition, a Shastra is the name for a body of teaching that is tested, that is robust. So there are many, many Shastras. There's Natya Shastra, the Shastra of the performing arts and dance. There is Shilpa Shastra, the Shastra of sculpture and the um, associated constructive arts, for example. So a Shastra basically sets out knowledge that has been tested and proven. So for example, Chris, you are a body worker, yeah? So in the, tr the tradition of Thai massage, they mapped the body. They tested that over many, many generations. And then it became, you could say, the Shastra of that method. Other people could come along and say, actually, you can map it like this. And they may be right too, but it doesn't negate what's already set out in that Shastra because it's, this is also valid. It's been tested over many, many generations. And so it becomes a Shastra. So yoga, was around for thousands of years before the Yoga Sutra. But what we find in the Yoga Sutra, a bit like in the Bhagavad Gita, these two texts, one of the things that they share is that they basically distill a lot of practical wisdom from the yoga tradition into a very robust, resilient form. So sometimes people say all sorts of things about the Yoga Sutra. I've heard some people say, oh, yoga began with Patanjali who wrote the Yoga Sutra, but this is a misperception. Patanjali didn't invent yoga. What he did was he codified an extant body of knowledge and distilled it into the sutra form. There's no way he was the originator of yoga. <laughs> yoga had been around for hundreds of generations by the point Patanjali wrote the sutra. The sutra was possible because of all that testing and investigation over so many generations. So what we find in Yoga Sutra, here we are two and a half thousand years later, we can look into the text and it's true, it's real, it works, it's practical. Why is it so perennially valid? Because it was tested for thousands of years before it was distilled into this form. So this is one of the beauties of the yoga tradition. Why are we still interested in yoga in the 21st century? Why has it survived these thousands of years? Because it works, because it's relevant, because it's practical. So these are a few of the reasons why the text is so treasured. One of the other things that's special about the Yoga Sutra is, in my opinion, the person who codified them into the Sutra form, the person who wrote them down. Now, Patanjali, who's the author, you might say, of the Yoga Sutra, the Sutrakara, the one who made them into a Sutra, he's also known as a Maharishi. A Rishi means one who sees, one who can see beyond duality, beyond partiality beyond conditioned ideas, beyond identifications that limit us, one who can see the whole picture of existence. And a Maharishi doesn't just see, the Maharishi also has the capacity to transmit that vast vision to others in a way that can help us see in ways we've not managed to see before, that can give us practical guidance. And this is why it's called a Maharishi. But Patanjali isn't just a Maharishi, he's also known as the most eminent of sages in the Sanskrit tradition because Patanjali wasn't just a great yogin he's also known as a great Ayurvedic physician a Vaidya in the Sanskrit and the foremost of grammarians and this is significant why am I mentioning this because the Yoga Sutra is written in the sutra form of Sanskrit and this is a very hard form to compose because it's very, very pared down. So you have to be an absolute master of language to write a sutra text, and Patanjali was this. Sanskrit is so-called because it means well-made. So along came this sage called Panini, and he codified the language as it was at that time. And because he codified, it was called Samskrita, well-made, well-described, well-encoded. He wrote this magnum opus called the Ashtadhyayi, the eight chapters on grammar, and it's a vast text. After that, 
there was a, another principal commentator, and then came Patanjali, and he wrote a text called the Maha Bhasha. Bhasha means commentary, Maha great, the great commentary on Panin's Ashtadhyayi. Sometimes these three commentators, well, Panini and then the, the two commentators, they don't always agree on everything. And the grammarians say, if there's any doubt, you go to Patanjali. He is the last word. He's the ultimate authority on grammar in this most grammatical of languages. So the person who set these teachings into the linguistic form was an absolute master of language and the Sanskrit language. And this is very significant. I'm emphasizing this because there are several places in the Yoga Sutra where what is stated or what is not stated is highly, highly significant in terms of the importance of some of the teachings. And we'll encounter that today. But he was an absolute, potentially in my opinion, is, is just a jaw-dropping genius with the language. And we'll see this as we get into the teachings a little bit more. So, Patanjali, he's a yogin, he's a realized master, and not just is he realized, but he has the capacity to transmit this to others in a linguistic way. And the sutra text, it's the text that distills the foundational teachings of yoga and makes yoga a shastra. Now there are some schools, tantric schools for example, that expand on the teachings found in the yoga sutra, but they don't negate the yoga sutra, they build upon it. So it's a very, very helpful reference text. There are some people who, in a trendy way, say, oh, why are we so excited about the Yoga Sutra? What about all these other texts? But most of my teachers in India all recognize, even if they're not particularly uh, devoted to the yoga lineage, they recognize Patanjali's genius, and they recognize that in the Yoga Sutra, he provides many very important definitions of states of awareness that other schools of philosophy use. They don't negate him, they work with him. And so it's a tremendously useful text to get some familiarity with. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at how the sutra begins and consider some of the core or key teachings from the first chapter. So one thing we encounter in yoga is that in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, yoga is defined as samatva. Samatva means evenness. And as karma sukhaushalam, which means skillfulness in the things that we do. And this skillfulness is usually demonstrated in yoga techniques and in yoga texts. So, for example, often when people do a yoga asana practice, what's the first posture people often do? or the first instruction, sometimes is samastiti, to stand in evenness. So it's like I'm setting an energetic blueprint for the rest of the practice. I'm starting as I mean to go on. If I can truly come to samastiti there, I don't need to do any other postures, I'm already in that state of evenness and integration and balance. Similarly with yoga texts, generally they give us the whole teaching right at the beginning and then it gets elaborated. So if somebody who's very advanced comes to the teaching, they get the teaching right away. They don't need to read the whole text. They've already got it. No need to waste time. Yoga's all about efficiency. But potentially is also very humane and very generous. If we don't manage to get it, he elaborates things. So what we find in the first chapter is the whole teaching in essence. And we find this really distilled in the opening sutras. And then it's elaborated into this first chapter. And then the subsequent chapters elaborate the process of yoga, things we can experience along the way, and the experience of yoga. The opening of the text is also very significant. So the first word is utter. Say utter. 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 And utter means now. But there's more than one way of saying now in Sanskrit. And utter is the now that connotes immediately the sense of now that something has happened. Now that's different from then. And what is different? Basically, this now means now that I know that I do not know. Now that I've seen that I haven't got it all worked out. Now that I have, for example, I've explored the ways of um, 
money and fame and getting the job promotion and marrying this person and living in that locale and it still hasn't brought me to ultimate satisfaction. Now I know that these worldly temptations don't bring me to that place of inner serenity, repose, calm and the overflow of abundant love. Now I'm ready to look somewhere else. Now that I have been well seasoned in the ways of, traditionally speaking, of grammar and logic, now I have established the tools to help me explore reality skillfully with a steady compass and clear discerning intelligence. Now I'm ready to dive into yoga. Does that make sense? So sometimes we think, oh yeah, I, I got it all worked out. Prerequisite for yoga, there are two. One, to be born as a human being, okay? Tick, yes, here I am. Second, to own and acknowledge and recognize I'm not in yoga. I haven't quite fully integrated all of myself. Sometimes I do things that I don't really want to do. Sometimes I do things that I don't want to do even though I know I don't want to do them. Sometimes it feels like I'm pulled in different directions. I'm not in that state of total integration. So now, with that awareness, with that humility, with that openness, now I can actually explore the practical teachings of yoga. I'm receptive to them. If I think I've got it all worked out, it's like I'm closed. So in the yoga tradition, the, they use the image of a patra. Patra means leaf. And cups were made from leaves, just like the plates. So a good patra is open, is empty, has space to receive the beautiful drink of the teaching. For example, I like coconut water. If I have my, here's my bottle, it's actually full of water. So my friend comes by with some just freshly cut coconut water. So, oh, would you like to fill your bottle? I say, oh yeah, yeah. And I give him my bottle, it's already full. What happens? He pours the coconut water in and it's just all wasted. So if I feel, yeah, I've got it all worked out, there's no space to receive the teachings. So now that I know that I do not know, yoga can unfold. And the opening sutra says, now we'll unfold the sequential presentation of the teachings of yoga in a Shastra form. And then potentially says, yogaha chitta vritti nirodaha. So in the second sutra, this is really kind of potentially is distillation of the whole teaching. Yoga is the state in which there is the nirodaha of the vrittis, of the chitta. So we have these Sanskrit words. What do they mean? Yogaha is the nirodaha of the vrittis, of the chitta. So chitta, chit means consciousness. Chitta means that which moves through consciousness, which is experienced within consciousness. Vritti, vrit, vartate. Vrit has the sense of rolling along, moving along. But this rolling or moving along is synonymous in the Indian vision of life as existing, as living, because life is rolling along. Life is a cycle, life is a pulsation. It's expansion, it's contraction, it's up cycle, down cycle. So Chitta Rodaha. there are some published editions of the Yoga Sutra where they say things like, yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind, things like this. This is not a wrong translation, but it does that thing of kind of limiting the way that the original verses reach out. The original sutra, the lighthouse, points its wisdom and its guidance out in so many different directions. One of the things that's absolutely amazing in the Yoga Sutra is that Patanjali's statements are valid from gross to subtle, from the level of the beginning practitioner is the person who is at a much more rarefied state of awareness. So yoga ha chitta vritti nirodaha is not just a description of the ultimate state of yoga, it also describes the state that we can experience as we cultivate long yoga along the way of practice. Chitta vritti nirodaha. So chitta, we are having conscious experience, would you agree? Yeah. And it's moving, it's rotating, it cycles. Sometimes our awareness is more in one area of life, sometimes it's more in another area of life. Things wax and wane. Nirodaha has the connotation of being checked, 
Like once I've checked something, I've become aware of it, yeah? So I brought it into my conscious awareness. Vritti, things are cycling, things are moving. So one way we can consider this verse very practically is yoga is that state of awareness in which all the movements, cycles, pulsations, ups, downs, expansions, contractions of all of the different constituent powers of my awareness, when they have been brought into cohesion, this is the state of yoga. So yoga is a state of balance and harmony and integration. So last week we spoke about the Sankhya model of reality and we looked at this map. And you may notice if you look at this sheet, on the right side I've put chitta. So our antakarana, our internal instrument of our buddhi, our discerning awareness, our ahankara, our sense of I, me, mine, our sense of identity, manas, the gateway between our internal awareness and the sense and action powers that interface and interact with the external realm of the tanmatraha, those portions of existence that we have evolved to be able to experience, and the panchamahabhutaha, the five great things that have become earth, water, fire, air, and space of which our ex existence is constituted. We experience all these things. These things are all part of the realm of our consciousness, our conscious experience. Would you agree? And these things wax and wane. These things move. They're alive. They're not static. So Chitta Vritti Nirodha, one way we can understand it, is when the movements through all of this realm of awareness, when we've come to apprehend them, understand them, integrate them, when we're really aware of them all, this is the state of yoga. If the vrit, vrit also has the connotation of living. So I could ask somebody, where do you live? Let's say our friend Habib is over there. And we say, where do you live, Habib? And Habib says, I'm living in San Cristobal de, la, de las Casas. And we say, okay, Habib, San Cristobal de las Casas, vartate. This is the third person singular of the root vrit. So that person vrits in San Cristobal. He lives, he dwells. Life is movement. So the definition of yoga as the cessation of thought, yes, we can access that, mo that moment, that experience where thought is suspended and the awareness is just there. But this definition is much broader than that. And I would suggest that what it really means is yoga is that state when all the powers of our awareness come into cohesion, togetherness, all oneness. They come to a state where they're all mutually supportive and then they help us experience more. Potentially goes on to say, third sutra, tada, then, when this chitta happens, drashtuhu svarupe vastanam. Then there is the establishment, svarupe, in its own essential form, drashtre, drashtuhu, of the drashtre, of the seer, of the witness, of the underlying consciousness which is enabling our experience. So the idea is when we come into yoga, we experience our underlying conscious essence. We experience our true self, the deepest, subtlest part of who we are. So this is not only glimpsed or accessed when we come to that state of complete void, in the sense of being devoid of any partiality, devoid of any association, the awareness is just there, pure, clear, unadulterated. We also get at least some quality or degree of this experience in action, in activity, when we're doing that activity and we're fully there. When our thought, our word, our action are all aligned. How does that feel? Fantastic, yeah, it gives us that sense of wholeness, fullness, oneness. So yes, ultimately, yoga or samadhi, integration, maybe describes that state where there is no thought, there's no colouring of awareness by association or idea. But also, we can get some experience of yoga, also known as samadhi or integrated awareness, in activity as we're practising. And this is one of the beautiful things about Patanjali. At the end of the first chapter, in the last few verses, he will delineate all these different stages and gradations of samadhi, that integrated, balanced yogic awareness. So Yogacitta Rodha is not an absolute state. It also describes 
the state of awareness that we can experience along the way in all these different gradations. Yes, ultimately the awareness may reside where it's not colored by any association. But in the meantime, we can also experience yoga, even when we still have our prejudice and our partialities and our conditioned ideas, when we bring ourselves as best as we can into the here and now. And we let all the powers of our awareness, our sense powers, our action powers, our mind, our emotions, we bring them all into the here and now. What do we experience? Yoga. It feels full. It feels whole. This is also yoga. And yoga is never an absolutist doctrine. It's very practical. So we start where we are, wherever we are, as best as we can. We invite wholeness, we invite balance, we invite integration. And when we come into integration, we experience a little more of the quality of who we are, this infinite creative potential of pure conscious awareness. Then comes the question, well, if really I'm only pure conscious awareness, why am I not experiencing it all the time? And so Patanjali tells us, he says, because what happens is the rest of the time, the awareness will get localized. We are animate beings, we want to stay alive. So it's quite normal to focus on the things at hand. And so potentially, this is an example of his tremendous genius. How many ways can our awareness get localized? Countless, infinite ways. He says he breaks them down into five categories. He says one way is that our awareness can be localized and it can be seeing something accurately. So here I am in this moment and I'm looking at the bottle and I'm perceiving it as a bottle. So I'm having correct perception. And here potentially there's another amazing thing. At the same time as he introduces this first way that our awareness can become localized, he also mentions what are the valid means of knowledge or knowing in the Yoga Shastra. So he says you can have direct perception, you can have inference, and we can also use reliable testimony to help us. Because yoga is very pragmatic, let's use all the means at our disposal. So I'm having the direct experience. Or, for example, I look out at the mountain and I see smoke on the mountain. And what do I understand? Oh, there's a fire on the mountain. Because smoke and fire are universally concomitant, so I can infer the fire. The third way that yoga allows to know something is reliable testimony. Now, some people say, how can any testimony be reliable? Everybody has their biases. But say, for example, we're out walking in the mountains. And Chris, you're ahead of me. And you realize, ooh, there's a, there's a big uh, branch, easy to trip on. So you, you turn back and say, oh, careful here, there's this branch that's sticking out. I almost tripped over and fell off the edge. You've experienced, you've had the direct perception. And from that vantage point, from that experiential understanding, you can turn back and share that understanding with us. So yoga says, yes, we can all work together. We can help each other. We can practice as a group. We can use satsang. And satsang is also recognized being so helpful for practice. Satsang meaning a group of people that come together to explore what is, to explore what's real, to explore what's true, to explore what's helpful for our own path of evolution. And if we're on a path of evolution together, sometimes some people will have insights that can be helpful for the others. So says we can use those things. But potentially we'll say later on, when it comes to the ultimate experience of total yoga, there's no inference, there's no hearing it from anybody, there's no reading about it. You have to experience it for yourself. But along the way, let's be practical. Our friends can help us. We can infer. We do have an infer in inferential intelligence. We can use these things. And so then he continues. So I can be seeing something as it is, accurate perception. Or I could be seeing something as it is not. So a classic example is the snake and the rope. I'm walking through the forest and I see a snake-like object on the pathway in front of me. What happens? My body goes into fight, flight, freeze response. The adrenaline is real. I freeze and I see the snake-like object is not moving. I'm not moving either, but the snake-like object still doesn't move. And then I start to think, maybe it's not a snake. The fright was real, but then I realized, oh, maybe it's not a snake. And that, so gingerly I walk forwards and, oh, it wasn't a snake, it's just a, a rope that looks like a snake. And then I breathe in a little sigh of relief. The fright was real, but I was seeing something as it is not. And of course, this is a 
relatively speaking, gross example, but this happens to us in so many ways. We see something as something it is not. Sometimes people think, for example, oh, if I just get an electric car, then I'll be sorted. No, no, no. The electric car is not the solution to all of your difficulties. Or if I just manage to take that thing. No, no, no. This is a misperception. Yeah? So we can be seeing accurately or we can be misperceiving. Our awareness is localized. The third way our awareness can localize is in what potentially describes as a vikalpa, which is the whole realm of imagination and ideas based on language. So for example, sometimes just a word can trigger something and it takes us to a whole other realm or it can stimulate some type of reaction within us. It's not that the thing signified by the word is in the room with us, but it influences our physiology and our neurology. We have this capacity as human beings to travel on the wings of imagination and fancy. So Vikalpa is the whole realm of association based on language. And we see this, is, this manifests so much in human beings' lives. The power of language. We hear something and it impacts us. We hear something and it influences us. I, here I am speaking. Sometimes I can say the same thing, but I can say it in a slightly different way. And maybe I say it in a different way. It's much more effective in, in terms of how it reaches the person who's listening, yeah? Because of the associations they have with certain words. A fourth way our awareness can congeal or localize, we can be in that state, state of sleep, nidra, in which it's as if the awareness is absent. But it's not completely absent, because when we wake up, we know more or less how we slept. So we have the experience that our awareness is not there, but actually it is to some degree. But it's, there's a dullness there. And then the fifth, smriti, memory. When our awareness lingers, stays connected to things that happened in the past. So basically, our awareness can be in the here and now, seeing accurately or inaccurately. We can be in the realm of imagination, association, projection, fancy, daydream. We can be in a state of absence, which could be deep sleep, or maybe sometimes happens in the day. I mean, I hope it's not happening to you now when you're listening to me, but sometimes, you know, you can be there and, it, oh, I was just off somewhere, and it's like I was absent for a moment. Or I can be recalling things. I can be in the past, and yoga is inviting us to step out of this projecting, imagining into the future, this holding on to the past, and inhabit this moment as cleanly, fully, totally as we can, so we can actually perceive the underlying essence. So in these five uh, categories, potentially condenses all these big gazillions of ways that our awareness can spin and jump all over the place into five categories. We can be in the here and now, seeing accurately or inaccurately, we can be projecting, dreaming, fantasizing. We can be as if absent in sleep or off with the fairies, as it were. Or we can be remembering something. So then what question comes? Yes, I recognize all of these states of awareness. That happens to me. What can I do about it? Never fear, Patanjali is here. And he tells us what to do about it. And he says, Abhyasa vairagya abhyam tan nirodaha. So tan refers back to those five ways that our awareness can get localized. They can be checked, they can be brought within our awareness by two things. Abhyasa vairagya abhyam. So the abhyam ending is a dual ending. By abhyasa and vairagya. And the order is, this is why the, gram, the grammatical aspect is very important when we look at the sutra. So this abhyasa vairagya abhyam, the bhyam ending tells us it's by first abhyasa and then the consequent resulting vairagya. Okay, so if abhyasa and vairagya is the remedy, is the solution, is the means to yoga, what's the next question? Well, what is abhyasa and what is vairagya? Guess what Patanjali does? He tells us what they are. So what is abhyasa? Tatrastitao yatno abhyasa satu dhirga kala nairantari satkara sevito dridabhumi. So first he defines a pyasa, which we could describe as practice. So first, if we want to come into yoga, we have to practice. Yoga is a practical school, and it's something we have to actively encourage and cultivate and foster. Yes, our ultimate essence, 
pure consciousness, we don't have to do anything to that. But we have become conditioned. We have become attached to all these partial viewpoints. Our awareness has been impacted and coloured and so veiled by all our conditioned ideas. And so we have to actively cultivate the situation that allows us to experience yoga. What is yoga practice? What does Patanjali say? Tatra stitao yatno bhyasa. Abhyas is the yatna. Yatna means an effort. It requires effort and engagement. What type of effort? It's the, oh, what's the effort for? Stitao, it's for the sake of steadiness. It's the initial definition of yoga practice. Yoga is the effort to foster steadiness. And then Patanjali elaborates the definition. He says, Satu dirga kala, long time. Nairantarya, uninterrupted. Satkara, done with real presence. Ah, sevita, and a spirit of dedication. Dridabhumi, then it becomes well rooted, well established. So, yoga practice is the wholehearted effort to foster steadiness. An effort that is long term, unbroken, attended to with genuine presence and commitment, then the practice will become well rooted. And remember, yoga is the practical school of how to live well as a human being here on earth. And here, Patanjali says, the practice will become well rooted when we do it with that great regularity, that commitment but everything grows from its roots. So as we practice, we may experience moments of transcendence or wonder. Wonderful. But what do we do with that experience? We have to integrate it back into the root system because we are earthlings. So practice, it isn't, it's not like it's not standing on the head, no. Putting the legs in lotus, no, 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 not, nothing to do with that. What is practice? It's the constant, unbroken, honest, steady, dedicated effort to foster steadiness or balance. In other words, when is yoga? Always. Now. What is yoga? Everything that we do. And then Patanjali talks about the second part of this recipe to foster yoga. First practice, then vairagya. Now vairagya, you might find it translated as non-attachment or detachment. And sometimes people get the wrong idea. They'll say, oh, he says you have to practice all the time and now he says you have to be non-attached. But if I'm going to practice all the time, I'm sure I have to be attached to my practice. This doesn't make sense. I reject this Patanjali. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not fair on Patanjali because what did he say? He said it's practice and the consequent resulting vairagya. So vairagya, Patanjali says, basically, I'll use my bottle again. Imagine you're very, very thirsty. And then you come across a coconut grove and an expert coconut harvester with his machete and his excellent climbing skills. And he's got these beautiful, fresh, tender coconuts. And he says, oh, you look thirsty there, wayfarer. Let me give you some refreshment. Here, drink a coconut. Oh, thank you so much. You saved me today. Oh, mm. oh so delicious. Would you like another, my friend? Oh, yeah, thanks. Oh, I, says, yeah, I, was, I was so thirsty. <sighs> the first one, you really drank it down quickly. The second one, you go, oh, wow, it's so t this is the finest coconut water I've ever tasted. You look very thirsty, my friend. How long have you been without water? Oh, I've been walking all morning. In this heat, have another one. He gives you a third coconut. Then he offers you a fourth and a fifth. What will you say sooner or later? No, no, thank you. I am full. Yeah? So, potentially defines vairagya as a state of being free from thirst. So, who is free from thirst? It's not like, I'm a yogi, so I don't get thirsty. I don't get thirsty. <laughs> if I have this idea, I'm just going to torture myself. The idea is, vairagya is the natural consequence of practice. When I practice wholeness, when I practice inviting all the constituent parts of my being into togetherness, then I will invite this experience of fullness. Once I get attuned to the richness that I can experience inside, 
when I interface with life from that integrated place, I am naturally, as a consequence of that, much less swayed and influenced and hooked or allured by the things that come and go outside. Because I know the real sweetness does not reside in, for example, the freshly cut pineapple or the freshly harvested mango. The real sweetness is in the way I meet life. When I taste the mango, like it's the first time I've ever tasted a mango, it's my last chance to taste the mango, how do I taste it? I taste it with that fullness of presence. And when I do something with fullness, it is fulfilling, it brings me satisfaction, so I'm not feeling a sense of lack. Does that make sense? So this is Vairagya. It's the thirstlessness in relation to the ephemeral things that come and go, these things that just pass us by, that we can enjoy for a moment, then they're gone. We're no longer so beguiled or caught up with them once we get attuned to that inner richness that comes by meeting whatever life throws at us from that more integrated place. So we could say, what is the recipe? Constant steady practice to foster steadiness, which has the consequence of inviting a greater sense of wholeness, satisfaction and fulfillment which then, without forcing anything, brings us to a state of being, a state of awareness, in which we don't feel so tempted or disturbed by the external things that come and go, because the internal state is so much fuller. So this is the method. Now, okay, if I'm going to do that, what does that require? And potentially says, basically, there are four essential qualities in order to practice yoga. And this is the 20th Sutra. It says, Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, Samadhi, Pragya, Purvaka, Itarisha. So before this Sutra, Patanjali said that some people or some beings, they will just naturally be in this state of awareness. So Patanjali says, when you practice and you come to Vairagya, then it's like your awareness can subtly move through these deepening states of samadhi and integration. Up to the point that one is living in this state in which one is no longer perturbed, disturbed by the comings and goings. One is, as it were, at one with everything. And Patanjali says, some beings are born like this. Remember this is a Shastra, so Patanjali's text has a comprehensiveness to it. If he didn't say this, somebody could say, ah, oh, my friend Ramana Maharishi, he didn't have to practice, he just woke up one day, said, who am I? And then he had the whole thing worked out. He didn't have to practice constantly, long term, with this you know, unwavering spirit of devotion. He just asked the question, who am I? Job was done. So potentially acknowledges this type of being can exist. And in the universe, there may be other types of being who just reside in that state. But for the vast, vast, vast majority of us human beings, it will take practice. And so Patanjali says, for the rest of us, who are not like Ramana Maharishi, or this class of beings, who don't have a human body, but there is, they're just at one with everything. For us, for the rest of us, this state of yoga will be preceded by Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, and Samadhi. Shraddha, very important word in yoga. Shraddha often gets translated as faith. You gotta have faith. I was walking past a shop the other day and the George Michael song was playing, the song from when I was a kid, yeah? You gotta have faith. However, this translation of Shraddha as faith can be misleading because these days, if you hear faith in English, for example, what do you think of, Venus? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, it's like trust, kind of, it's like focus and devotion on something that you might not necessarily see, but feel internally. Mm-hmm. Beautiful definition, yeah. Chris, what comes to mind if you hear the word faith? Surrender, trust with no proof or reassurance. Mm-hmm. Surrender, trust with no proof or reassurance. Trust something that you've not necessarily seen, but you have an inkling, a sense of it. Beautiful definitions, but 
What I've noticed is that for many people in the world today, when they hear the word faith, they think, oh, religion. They think believing something that somebody's told me. There are many connotations of this word faith. Some of them are much more in line with, way, with Shraddha. So the Sanskrit word Shraddha, etymologically, it takes its root from the word hrit, which is the word for heart. So Shraddha, it's not believing in something that sounds nice or something that somebody told me. It's the faith that comes from heartful experience. It's the type of self-trust that I can cultivate when I wholeheartedly explore life. So if I want to find out if something works, I've got to give it a faithful exploration. For example, let's say my friend goes to yoga class and starts feeling a lot better. And my friend tells me, hey man, this yoga class, it's, you should give it a try. I was so surprised. I, I feel much better in my body, but not only my body, I, I seem to have more space in my day. Yeah, it's made a huge difference. I can only recommend it. And you think, well, I'm not sure about this yoga, you know, I can see all just these ladies in leggings. What's he talking about? Let's say the friend goes to the yoga class, but the friend goes to the yoga class very half-heartedly, feeling like very skeptical, just doesn't really do what the teacher invites them to do. Can that person know if yoga works for them or not? Not really. They didn't give it a faithful try. One example I find helpful is, you know, like parkour, the guys who like navigate the landscape in the fastest, most efficient way possible. So for example, if I was on the second floor of a building, probably the most efficient way for me to go to the ground floor would be to take the stairs. But some parkour practitioners, they would just jump out of the second floor window because they've prepared the body to be able to make that type of big jump. If I see the parkour practitioner doing the second floor jump, and I think, oh, I just saw him do it. I believe I can do. And I jump out the second floor window. Maybe I will have a nasty injury. But if I say, wow, he's a human being. Let's say it's a 50 year old parkour practitioner. And I, he, I only started five years ago. Really? Yeah, yeah. Steadily. I, pra I, did, I, did, I practiced it like I was practicing yoga. Steady, unbroken, wholehearted with commitment. So what I started to do was I jumped up one step and then down, one step and down. I did it a thousand times until my joints felt really happy jumping the depth of one step. And after a couple of months, I got to two steps and three steps. You can see where it's going here. Yeah? After a couple of years, I realized I could jump from five meters and my body was ready, but it didn't happen overnight. First, I'd make the small jump. And I trust myself because I've experienced I can make that jump safely. And then I go to the next stage. I try a little bit more. Oh yeah, I can do it. Slowly, steadily, I build my trust. And one thing that one of my friends says, my friend Paul Millage, I remember he was teaching an acro yoga class. So acro yoga, sometimes people up in the air. And he said, when you're the person spotting, supporting, your job's the most important because he says, it's much easier to gain trust than regain trust. So here, Patanjali tells, if you want to practice yoga, you have to have this self-trust. You have to have this faith. You have to give things an honest try. If you don't try wholeheartedly, you'll never know. So just putting one foot in front of the other requires a certain amount of faith, you might say. But yoga means investigating, inquiring. So we have to do that with, in good faith. We have to give ourselves the chance to discover something that we've never uncovered before. We can only do this when we wholeheartedly explore the terrain. Why else do we need to have faith? <laughs> because what will happen once we start to practice yoga? So let's say our friend who was doubtful started coming to yoga class and they did make a faithful, wholehearted effort and then they had a great experience. And now they are very enthusiastic about yoga. I'll use my teaching aid bottle again. So the bottle is now representing yoga and I'm the person who's just begun practicing yoga. I used to have the back, bad back and now my back pain has gone. This bad back has been troubling me for years. It was always a pain and now it's gone. I wanted to be rid of it. I went to yoga, I started practicing regularly and now the pain's gone. How do I feel about yoga? Yoga. 
Oh, Yoga, I'm so glad I found you. I will always cherish you now. Now we're together. Ah, oh, it's what I've been waiting for my whole life. You'll, you know. But then what will happen? When that back pain got mitigated, got taken care of, it was like this thing that I'd been troubled by and I knew at the conscious level of my awareness I wanted to be free from, I'm now free of it. So how do I feel? I'm so happy. But in that experience of yoga, of greater balance in my system, it's like the whole system thinks, wonderful. We're in the integration game. And so the system, in its deep wisdom, it will now bring to the surface the next layer of dissonance, or the next layer of disharmony, or the next layer of thing that needs to be cleansed. Now the back pain, I already knew I want to be free of this. But maybe the next thing that comes to the level of my awareness is something that I hadn't really thought about. It's something from my shadow, something I've been ignorant of. But now, as I've been practicing this greater centered awareness, it's like my vision has expanded. I'm able to see more of myself. And now emerges to the surface level of my awareness a pattern that I would prefer not to look at because I've not looked at it all these years. I've kept it tucked away in my back pocket, but now it's sprung up and I'm facing it. And yoga has brought it here where I can no longer ignore it. And now how do I feel about yoga? Oh, can I just keep you over there? Can I just put you down out of sight? Thank you. I'd really rather just, oh, I'd like to go ballroom dancing. I always want to try ballroom dancing, never mind yoga. This could happen because we don't want to look at that thing. But we've already gained some shraddha, we've already gained some faith. In the effort to foster steadiness, in the effort to harmonize the system and eradicate the back pain, it's not so easy for me to just reject yoga because I've already got practical experience that it works. So now I'm confronted with this previously, relatively speaking, deep-seated habit of ignoring something and now I'm no longer ignoring it. There's a part of me that feels actually I could harmonize this tendency. I could heal it. I could integrate it. And this is the faith that propels me on. But it works in concert with the second quality that potentially mentions virya. And virya is the quality of a vira or vira, which means a hero or a heroine. And this is very important. Sometimes there are these yoga teacher training programs or yoga studios. They rarely, I've never seen it anyway, they rarely say on the door or in the brochure, when you start studying yoga, you are signing up for the army of the warriors of light and there's no turning back. And you have to be a hero to do this. Why do you have to be a hero to do it? Because yoga means going beyond the known. Really, this is nothing beyond us, because where have we come from? We all come from the same place. We all come from the womb. And how was it in there? It was pretty much the archetypal comfort zone. Steady temperature, constant food supply, mama's heart, the regular, reliable, percussive accompaniment to the day-to-day. -day. We have all we need, it's lovely in here. But then, somehow, it starts to feel a bit tight, a bit constricted. And then from somewhere deep inside comes the impulse. There must be something more than this. And then, we all did something tremendously heroic. We forced our way, we found our way into a place of greater constriction to then emerge forth into the breathing world. Inspiration, expiration, life and death. This is where we, nature, we are born, we will die, and in between we will experience change. But we emerged into nature when we crossed this threshold from the known into the vast unknown. From having everything safe and familiar to going into this place where we, we don't know. And so when we were born, we were all initiated into the path of the spiritual hero or heroine, the one who dares to go beyond the known. And in yoga practice, it's all about inquiry. It's all about looking in ways that reach beyond our habitual ways of looking. And this takes courage. And so the prime qualities for yoga, 
self-trust and courage or heroic valor. Patanjali also says you need to have smriti, memory. What does he mean here? The idea is as we practice heroically, valiantly, and then we get tested, then rises up to the surface the next level of challenge, we've got the memory that it's worthwhile bringing all my parts into togetherness. When I bring all these parts into oneness, I do have access to more power. I do have access to greater resources and I can move through those challenges more easily and it's so worth it when I do that hard work of integrating. If something comes into my awareness that I've previously been ignorant of, I've previously kept away, I've previously kept in the shadow, but now I see it, it can be easy to think, oh, I'll just keep on ignoring it. But actually that's self-sabotage. Once I've seen it, it's like my conscience is asking me to do the work of integrating it. That can be intimidating and forbidding. Hence, I need to have courage, I need to have faith. But if I make the effort, the honest, sincere effort to proceed with steadiness and do what I can to reconcile the situation, to harmonize the situation, then I will emerge on the other side tremendously empowered. And what will happen to my shraddha, my faith? It's gone up, it's got stronger. What happens to my courage? It is encouraged, I feel stronger. And so it's a self-validating, self-propelling path. Yoga doesn't ask us to believe anything. It's all, what's the word, investigable. We put it to the test in the arena of our own life experience. So yes, you need faith, but this is not blind faith. This is the faith and self-trust we get from putting things to the test in the laboratory of our own lives. When we make that heartful, courageous exploration. And the fourth quality is samadhi, that state of integration. So wherever we are, as best as we can, we invite samadhi, we invite yoga. And from that experience, we come to new understandings and they strengthen our self-trust, our self-reliance, they bolster our courage, and they give us a memory bank. So when we come to a great test and we feel like, wow, I'm so intimidated, we can think, ah yes, but I've been here before. This is more intimidating than what I might have faced before. This is a greater challenge. I don't know how I'm gonna reconcile these tendencies, these factions inside me that seem to be pulling me in different directions. Oh, I hadn't realized that I'd been so in my own way all these years and now I see it. Oh, I don't have to deal with this. But once I've already dealt with some of these self-sabotaging patterns, I know that actually this is a beautiful opportunity to bring myself into a place of greater empowerment and greater cohesion. So basic recipe, as best as I can, I invite integration. When I invite integration, I get an experience that integration is worth the effort. And so my self-trust deepens and my courage is bolstered. And so these four qualities all support each other. Does that make sense? So this is the basic yogic method. And it's already been described. And we're at Sutra 20. Then Patanjali introduces in Sutra 23 an alternative or an addition. He says, Ishwara Pranidhanad Va. And this wonderful particle in Sanskrit, Va. And Va means and, or, as well, in addition, optionally. So we've got the method. The method is you've got to just do your best to invite steadiness, presence. And it's a constant, steady, unbroken effort. And now in Sutra 23, or, to foster yoga, to invite yoga, you can Ishwara Pranidhana. It is by Ishwara Pranidhana, from Ishwara Pranidhana, that one can come to yoga. So what is Ishwara Pranidhana? So Pranidhana basically means to place one's effort, one's attention, one's energy towards that which we consider the supreme. So sometimes people talk about this as surrender to the highest or offering everything to God. God is a word that triggers what potentially calls vikalpa, the association based on language. Some people hear the word God and they think, oh, 
they're allergic to this word. Some people hear the word God and they feel beautiful, warm sensations. It can land very differently with different people. But guess what Patanjali will do? He will tell us in the next few sutras what he means by this term. And the way he describes it, I feel, even if you're the most um, allergic to God person, you will find his definition very welcoming. We'll come to that in just a moment. But first, Ishwara Pranidhana Adva. If I'm going to offer everything I do to that which I consider the highest, how am I going to do whatever I'm going to do? So, Venus, you are a chef here. Yeah? You said to me last week, the way you share your passion for local plant-based food is by sharing it with love, yeah? As somebody who has enjoyed eating your food, I guess this is a very effective way to share it. Because when the person tastes it, what do we taste? When somebody cooks with real love and presence, we don't just taste the beautiful ingredients. There is this extra infusion of quality into the dish, yeah? How? When you cook, where are you? Well, I, I feel like I'm present. I'm, yes. I'm in that, in that moment. So you're doing yoga, yeah? Mm -hmm. it's a, in order to, so, or, or you can get yoga through devotion. But basically, potentially, is just describing what is already described in a different way. If I'm going to make a wholehearted, constant, steady effort, what does that sound like? That sounds like devotion, yeah? If I'm going to consecrate my actions by offering them to that which I love, what does that basically mean practically? That means that whatever I'm doing, I do it with wholehearted presence. I do it, like for example, say you're cooking for Chris and you've not seen, you've, Chris had to go on a big adventure to the other side of the world. And every day you're waiting for it to come back. And then she comes back. And you know she's, you can sense her on the horizon. And you're going to cook her favorite meal. How will you cook that meal? Total presence, yeah? Like you'll be pouring your love into it. And then how will the meal be? Even better than normal. Yeah. This is Ishwara Pranidana. So do what we're doing with devotion. But this is another way of describing what Patanjali has already described. So, if you are a, um, an atheist in your outlook, you can work with the yoga method. You just cultivate steady presence. If you are a person of devotional persuasion, then you can use that, you can harness your devotional emotional qualities and channel them towards being more present and making your actions a beautiful offering of love. Two, Ishwara. Ishwara, which could be translated in many different ways. But how does Patanjali describe Ishwara? It's so beautiful. He says, Ishwara is a consciousness that is distinct, is a Purusha Vishesha. We are Purushas, we are conscious beings, but Ishwara is a Purusha Vishesha, it's a distinct Purusha because it is not limited by having a body or is limited by karma. So when we are incarnate, we get identified with our bodily vehicle. Is this true? And we get, we enter the realm of karma. I'm the subject, I'm looking, so I'll use my bottle again. I'm, I, am, I am me and the bottle is that. I'm this, I'm not that. So I, all, once I have a body and I get associated with it, I also come into the realm of karma where I'm the doer and that is the thing that's done. So we get into this realm of differentiation. Ishwara is a consciousness that is not subject to division or limitation based on karma or having a body. Also, Ishwara is a consciousness that is not limited by knowledge. So, for example, I, James, I'm speaking the English language. I know the English language to some degree. I could not sit here and deliver this presentation in the Korean language. I do not know the Korean language or the Mongolian language. So, I'm limited by knowledge. I'm limited by things I can do, things I can say. Ishra has no such limit. Ishra is described as the source, not just of knowledge, but the source of omniscience itself. So, Ishra is a consciousness that holds everything that all knowledge exists within that consciousness. So Ishwara is consciousness that is not limited by having a body or by karma or by any type of knowledge. And 
स एश पूर्वेशा भी गुरु कालेना नवचेदात। Also, Ishwara is not limited by time or place. So here I am speaking today in the state of Chiapas, in the country that's known as Mexico. I'm here in Mexico. I'm not there in the United Kingdom or in Japan, for example. Even though I have set foot on those land masses in the past, right here, right now, I'm in this place, and I'm limited by place. I'm limited by time. That's my experience. Ishwara is not. Because Ishwara was the guru of all of those who have gone before. So Ishwara, not limited by time, place, knowledge, capacity, action, or having a bodily form. But Ishwara is also the guru of all of those who have come before. So what does this tell us? What does guru mean, literally? Literally it means heavy. And the idea that the guru is any person, place or thing, the influence of which is heavy duty enough to shift us from one state of awareness to a vaster state of awareness. In other words, Ishwara, if Ishwara is the guru of all those who preceded us, of the ancients, this tells us that Ishwara is that which allows us to learn, that which allows us to evolve. So in other words, Ishwara is like our conscious essence, it's like our conscious, like the source of our intelligence. Tasya Vachakav Pranavaha. And Ishwara cannot be denoted. This is so beautiful. Tasya Vachakav Pranava. Ishwara can be connoted by the Pranava. Pranava means Om. What does Om mean? A, uh, the first sound I can make, M, mm, the last. So all means everything. So here potentially says, Ishwara cannot be denoted. You cannot name it. Ishwara is beyond name and form. As soon as I name something, like I call this object the bottle, and when I say it's the bottle, I also say what it, I don't just say what it is, I say what it's not. It, this is the bottle, it's not my hand. It's not this watch. So when I denote something, I delimit it, I define it by its limits. Ishwara cannot be delimited, cannot be denoted. It can only be connoted or suggested, and it's connoted or suggested by what? By the pranava, by the syllable om, which symbolizes from the first to the last, from the alpha to the omega, and everything in between. In other words, there is nowhere God is not. Ishwara is the consciousness in which everything exists. There is nowhere outside or separate from Ishwara. Tajapastadartabhavanam. By its repetition, one comes to understand it. Now, sometimes people think, oh, so I just go around chanting Om and then I will understand Ishwara. <laughs> what I think this really suggests is by repeatedly reminding myself that Ishwara is in everything, that everything is divine, that everything is the means, by walking on this beautiful planet with reverence and devotion, appreciation and presence, this is the attitude that can remind me what life really is, where I really am, and that I'm never actually separate from this Ishwara. It's the substrate of existence itself. So by dedicating myself to that, by offering myself to that type of outlook, I can also come to yoga. And this makes sense, because what does yoga mean? To include, to gather, to bring into oneness or a state of all oneness. So when I repeatedly remind myself that everything is one, yes, that makes sense. That will invite and encourage and cultivate this state of yoga. So up to now, we've had the basic method and the alternative orientation towards it. So the basic method, here I am, I have conscious awareness. It's moving in all these different directions. It flits here and there. That's completely normal. Yoga means let's pay attention. Let's notice how the awareness flits here and there. And let's make an effort to come into steadiness. So instead of being pulled in different directions and my awareness becoming dispersed and scattered, let me, as it were, take the reins of my awareness so I can channel the power of my awareness to help me be more centered, more integrated. And when I come into a place of greater centeredness and integration, then I can experience my wholeness. 
through that practice, I can come to understand my deep essential nature. In order to do that, I'll have to make a whole hard steady effort and that will take courage. It will take self-trust. I will need to keep making a steady effort. And the alternative is I offer all my actions to that which I consider the highest. But in order to make my action an offering, I can only do that if I am present in a constant steady way. So this is the basic method. We'll pause here and continue perhaps in a moment.